Welcome, friends, to another Paul is Dead discussion. The following presentation on the McCartney conspiracy will cover approximately 70 slides. Some of the content in this video I have discussed during other shows, but not to the degree that I felt was required to really drive the points home. So this presentation will go deeper into some of that material. This video also includes new content, specifically with regard to the theory of two permanent Paul replacements. And I would also like to thank all those who have shared their research with me. It is the collective effort that will help us break the Paul is Dead code. And so with that, let's move to the table of contents. I will start the presentation off by talking about the many faces of Paul McCartney. Then we will spend some time talking about the Pyramid of Power and Freemasonry. I will then present an overview of Tavistock. We'll talk about titles and awards, specifically with regard to the British Crown. Then we'll take a look at how to read and interpret the memoirs of Billy Shears. We will then discuss the Masonic technique of masterfully speaking. Then we'll get into the possible death scenarios of Paul McCartney. Then the theory of the two falls or the primary replacements. Then we'll get into some dot connecting and other perspectives. And then we will discuss the Vivian Stanshall and Phil Ackrell linkage to Bill. And then I will conclude the presentation with a summary of findings. And be sure to stick around after the presentation where I have included some interesting video clips I have compiled over time. And so with that, let's move to the next slide and the many faces of Paul McCartney. There were different iterations of Paul McCartney seen by the public over the years. I will present a case for two permanent replacements who were in place before 1966. Aside from the two permanent replacements, there were other actors who paged in and out playing the part over time. Since the internet as we know it began around 1990, it is my contention that many of the images were docked starting in the 1960s in order to confuse and condition the public. This means those controlling the PSYOP had 25 to 30 years to alter images along with photographing the various actors playing the role over that time span. The different actors in altering of photos is the main reason why many Paul is Dead researchers have difficulty deciphering who is who over the past 50 years or so. And to prove this point, let's take a look at some of those pictures. I had known of the Paul is Dead theory going back to the mid-1970s and I studied the clues, but I chalked it up as the Beatles being clever and a marketing ploy to sell more records. Then around two and a half years ago, I read the memoirs of Billy Shears, and this reignited my interest in the Paul is Dead conspiracy. After reading the book, I decided to put a collage of pictures together to see if the conspiracy was really worth looking at, resulting in the slides you see here. And much to my amazement, the differences were not even subtle. For example, picture number one, which is biological Paul, looks nothing like picture number two, which is supposed to be McCartney during the 1964-65 era. In picture number three, we can see that version of Paul has a different nose in picture number one, where the nostrils in picture number three are flared. Picture number four shows a longer chin and jawline, as does picture number five. Picture number six has similarities to biological Paul, but it still looks very different than the other images. With picture number seven, we see yet again another version of Paul who looks nothing like picture number eight, and picture number eight is clearly not the same person in picture number one. So as you can see, this was starting to become very interesting. Now let's move to the next slide. Again, with this collage, we have biological Paul in the number one position. Picture number two is allegedly a picture of Paul before Beatle fame, but in actuality appears to be a composite image morphing the face of bio Paul and a replacement, most likely Bill Shepard. Picture number three, in my opinion, looks nothing like Paul. Picture number four has the longer chin and beak nose, as does pictures number five, seven, and eight. To me, picture number six has the closest resemblance to biological Paul than any of the other pictures. And in case anyone was wondering, it is my opinion that pictures number four, five, seven, and eight are Bill Shepard, with pictures number three and six being other actors. Now let's talk a bit about Michael Jackson. As I have mentioned in a number of shows, the surgery a Paul replacement went through was extensive. It is not a simple case of a facelift. We are told in memoirs that aside from the surgeries, there were fillers to round out the face and also the use of latex, which we will discuss next. Now, Michael Jackson is a great example of how surgery can completely change the appearance of a person's facial features. Here we have six images of Michael Jackson taken over time. Picture number one is Michael when he was a young boy with the Jackson 5. If we ask someone who had no knowledge of Michael Jackson, if the person in picture number one is the same person in picture number four, they would in all likelihood say no. If we ask that same individual if the person in picture number two 
is the same person in picture number 5, or if the person in picture number 3 is the same person in picture number 6, I would bet the response would be, no, they are not the same person. However, those of us familiar with Michael Jackson know that all of the pictures above are indeed Michael, and his facial appearance changed drastically over the years due to surgeries. So when folks are skeptical about the ability to alter someone's appearance to look like Paul McCartney, I point to Michael Jackson as Exhibit A. Now let's take a moment and talk about latex. In a moment, I'm going to show you two videos proving latex is definitely being used as part of Fall's or Bill's disguise. The first clip is from a 1970s rehearsal of Jet. In that clip, I will slow down and freeze frame the video at the point where the latex sags and drops into his lower neck area. The second clip is Fall being interviewed by Bob Costas. I believe it was the early 1990s. During the interview, Fall places his index finger to his right temple area and the latex bunches and then takes a moment to smooth out again once he removes his finger from his face. So let's take a look at both those videos now. Okay, here's the jet rehearsal from the 1970s. I believe it was 1973. Pay very close attention to Bill's neck and throat area. You're going to see the latex disfigure and it's going to drop and droop into his lower neck. Here it is in slow motion. Let's play it again in slow motion. And you can see how it has disfigured. And here's the still. Okay, so something's not right, and the something that's not right is the latex not staying in place. Here is the Bob Costas interview. Watch when Bill places his index finger to his temple area, and then when he removes his finger, you're going to see that the latex takes a little while to reform. Now let's do that in slow motion. Okay, so watch. He keeps his finger there, and as he does, the latex starts to scrunch up. And by the way, law enforcement will tell you that somebody who speaks and touches their face often, they will tell you that that is a possible sign of deception and not telling the truth. I'll just put that out there. Now he'll take his finger away from his face and take a look at what happens. The latex does not reform quickly. It takes a little while. Take a look at that. Here's a still. And you can see how the latex is bunched up under his finger. And then another still afterwards where it, it took some time to reform. Okay? That's latex, folks. Now let's talk a bit about Freemasonry and the Illuminati, both of which Bill discusses in the memoirs of Billy Shears in a chapter titled Masonic Checkmate. The G in Freemasonry represents God, geometry, and gatekeeper. The 33 degrees equals the 33 vertebrae of the spine. There are 13 degrees above the 33rd degree, known as the degrees of the Illuminati. The 13 degrees correspond to the 13 major parts of the brain. There are 20 degrees of rank above the Illuminati that few humans have ever heard of. High degree Masons receive the secret Luciferian rituals. Masons do much of the Illuminati's networking, and Bill references the Committee of 300. And Lucifer rules the world. Let's move to the next slide. This slide is a graphic of what I refer to as the Pyramid of Power. We see the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite at the bottom of the pyramid. Then the next level up are the 13 degrees of the Illuminati. And then above that, 20 additional degrees, consisting of people or beings we will most likely never know. And at the very top of the pyramid is Lucifer. When we total the degrees, it sums to 66. There are 66 chapters in memoirs. It's my belief that Bill is above the 33rd degree and in the illuminated degrees. I base this on the fact that Bill is allowed to tell us about the Pyramid of Power and also how I observe high-ranking Freemasons behave around him, like 32nd and 33rd degree Masons. It's a subtle interaction, but other Masons defer to Bill, indicating he is of higher rank. One example that comes to mind was a private event at the White House when Bill was sitting next to Barack Obama and Jerry Seinfeld was doing a stand-up. The body language of both Bill and Obama gave the impression to me that Obama was hosting a superior, and Seinfeld, in his routine, came across tentative and appeared to step lightly around the jokes when his routine included Bill or the Beatles. In other words, Seinfeld looked as if he was being very careful not to insult the guest of honor. The next time he's doing an interview, take a look at the body language and how the other person takes a measured approach when speaking to Bill. And now let's move to the next slide. 
Here's a slide I put together a while back to show how Masonic symbolism is hidden in plain sight. Here we have two iconic Beatle releases, the Red and Blue Greatest Hits albums. The 1963 through 1966 Red album represents the Masonic Red Lodge and the Biological Paul era. And the Blue album, which covers the 1967 through 1970 time period, symbolizes the Masonic Blue Lodge and Bill's tenure with the Beatles. And of course the lyric from Hello Goodbye, I don't know why you say goodbye, I say hello, is Bill telling us not to fret. He's here to carry on the Beatle legacy. And as a side note, notice how both aprons look exactly like the Gmail icon. And with that, let's move to the next slide and talk about Tavistock. Tavistock was founded in 1920 as the Tavistock Institute of Medical Psychology. In September 1947, it became the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. Note September being the ninth month, and the sum of the last two digits of the year 47 totaling to 11, and we have the 9-11 date being played again. Tavistock is headquartered in London and has strong ties to Freemasonry. The publicly stated mission of Tavistock is to combine research into social sciences with professional practice. However, alternative researchers have found that Tavistock is in the business of modifying individual behavior through psychology, meaning they are developers of mass mind control. Tavistock techniques break down the psychological strength of the individual, and crowd control methods have been widely used on the American public. The use of drugs is a common denominator identifying Tavistock's strategy. For example, the LSD counterculture of the 1960s, the student revolution, etc., were all financed by the CIA to the tune of $25 million, and Tavistock controls the National Education Association. No one achieves prominence in any field unless trained in behavioral science at Tavistock or one of its subsidiaries. Its network now extends from the University of Sussex to the United States through the Stanford Research Institute, the Esalen Institute, MIT, the Hudson Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the Center of Strategic and International Studies at Georgetown, where State Department personnel, U.S. Air Force Intelligence, and the Rand and Mida corporations are trained. A network of secret groups, like the Mont Pelerin Society, the Trilateral Commission, the Ditchley Foundation, and the Club of Rome are all conduits for the Tavistock Network. So as we can see, Tavistock's influence is pervasive across the controlling apparatus, and its main goal via the music industry is to social engineer the masses. Now let's discuss titles bestowed upon many in the music and entertainment industry. Many times we become aware of ceremonies where an artist is knighted or receives some award by the Queen or some other royal entity. The most excellent order of the British Empire is an order of chivalry established on June 4, 1917 by George V. The order comprises five classes in civil and military divisions. One way to tell who's in the big club that we don't belong to is by the titles awarded by the British Crown. It is my contention that none of these titles are given to anyone who is not in the club or within the pyramid of power. These titles are awarded to individuals based on their level of contribution in support of the controller's agenda. Many prominent artists will have the letters MBE, OBE, or CBE after their names, or be referred to as Sir, where Sir means in service to the crown. All of these people, whether they admit it or not, are within the pyramid structure, meaning they are part of various secret societies, with Freemasonry being the most prominent. Here are the five classes in ascending order of seniority. First is the MBE, or Member of the Order of the British Empire, which is given for outstanding achievement or service to the community. All four Beatles received their MBEs back in 1965. The OBE, or Officer of the Order of the British Empire, is awarded for having achieved a major local role in any activity, including work which has made that person known nationally in their chosen area. The CBE, or Commander of the Order of the British Empire, the CBE is awarded for having a prominent but lesser role at the national level or a leading role at the regional level. It can also be awarded for a distinguished or innovative contribution to any area. Then we have the KBE or DBE, a knight or dame commander of the Order of the British Empire. If you are a man and you receive a KBE, you can use the title Sir. If you are a woman, you can use the title of Dame. Notable non-Brits are only eligible for honorary knighthood, meaning they are not allowed to add sir or dame to their names. They do, however, get to append the suffix KBE to their monikers if they desire to do so. Bono, Bill Gates, Steven Spielberg, and Michael Bloomberg are all technically KBEs. 
And last but not least is the highest award, the GBE, or a Knight or Dame Grand Cross, which is very rare. Now let's take a look at a small sampling of names in the club who have received these awards. Here is a very partial list of artists that have received MBEs, OBEs, CBEs, and or the KBE. Ian Anderson, Bono, Eric Clapton, Joe Cocker, Roger Daltrey, Ray Davies, David Essex, Brian Ferry, Barry Gibb, David Gilmore, George Harrison, Mick Jagger, Elton John, Tom Jones, Annie Lennox, George Martin, Brian May, Paul McCartney, Van Morrison, Graham Nash, Olivia Newton-John, Jimmy Page, Cliff Richard, Ravi Shankar, Ringo Starr, Rod Stewart, and Sting. And now let's take a look at some artists that have received the KBE or have been knighted. Bob Geldof, KBE, Sir George Martin, Sir Paul McCartney, Sir Elton John, Ravi Shankar, KBE, Sir Mick Jagger, Bono, KBE, Sir Van Morrison, Sir Rod Stewart, Sir Ray Davies, David Bowie, who rejected his, Sir Richard Starkey, and Sir Barry Gibb. And again, this is a very, very small example of artists and musicians who have received this type of recognition from the British Crown. Now let's move to the next segment and discuss the importance of occult numbers within the Beatles' construct. Another very significant variable in the controlling matrix and with the Beatles as part of Tavistock's social engineering is numbers. In the mystery religions, numbers are woven into the very fabric of existence. The adepts and initiates within the matrix utilize numbers to steer human consciousness in the direction they have plotted out. A fabulous book that helped me to understand the importance of numbers is The Secret Science of Numerology by Shirley Blackwell Lawrence. I highly recommend the book to anyone wanting to understand how numerology is embedded in everything we experience in this reality, including the words we speak. Now let's take a look at the awards given to the Beatles, along with the numbers, and see if the nines and sixes are in play. As I mentioned earlier, all four Beatles received their MBEs back in 1965, with John Lennon returning his four years later. The receiving of the MBEs is a strong indicator of the Beatles being members of the club or Freemasons. In the memoirs of Billy Shears, Bill tells us he's all about the sixes and biological Paul is all about the nines. And as I have discussed in other shows, the nines and sixes are used over and over within the Beatles construct. We have Revolution number 9, John Lennon's number 9 dream, biological Paul's last name having nine letters, Bill utilizing dates, regrouping to nine for album releases. The Beatles' first album was released on March 22nd or 322, the Skull and Bones number, which regroups to 3 times 22, or 66, representing the 66 degrees within the pyramid structure. Sgt. Pepper was released on June 1st, or 6 times 1, which equals 6. Biological Paul's birthday is June 18th, which reconciles to 6 plus 1 plus 8, which equals 15, and then 1 plus 5 equals 6. And the last two digits of the year 1942, 4 plus 2, sums to 6. So Biological Paul's date of birth regroups to 66 as well. Now let's take a look at the numbers associated with Beatle MBEs, knighthoods, and other honors. The Beatles received their MBEs on October 26, 1965. Note that the last two digits of the year, 65, 6 plus 5 equals 11. 11 is a master number in Freemasonry. October 26 breaks down to 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 6, which equals 9. Therefore, the Beatles received their MBEs on 9-11. John Lennon returned his MBE on November 25, 1969. Again, notice the last two digits of the year, 6 and 9. November 25 breaks down to 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 5, which equals 9. Bill, as McCartney, was knighted on March 11, 1997. March 11 equals 3 times 11, which equals 33, another master number within Freemasonry, and 3 times 3 equals 9. Bill was 60 when he was knighted in 1997. 6 plus 0 equals 6. Ringo was knighted at age 77, an occulted number, on March 20, 2018. March 20 is 3 times 20, which equals 60. 6 plus 0 equals 6. Bill, as McCartney again, received the Companion of Honor on May 4, 2018. May 4 is 5 plus 4. 
5 plus 4 equals 9. So as we can see, the occulted numbers, especially the 6s and 9s, are very important to the Beatles story. Now let's shift gears a bit and talk about whether the Beatles were ever organic, meaning untainted by masonry or Tavistock. There are Paul is Dead researchers who naively believe the Beatles were untouched by the Matrix and only became a Tavistock or Masonic entity upon the death of Paul McCartney and the arrival of Bill. It is very important to understand the music and entertainment industry, along with just about everything else within this realm, is completely controlled. As I mentioned in the Tavistock portion of this presentation, no one achieves prominence in any field without being connected into the Pyramid of Power. One can argue the Beatles were possibly organic during the very early days when they were playing the Cavern in Hamburg, but even this is a dubious claim when we have Stuart Sutcliffe making Masonic hand gestures during the early years when he was playing with the Beatles. To put a stake in the ground, it is certain the Beatles were controlled once they were quote-unquote discovered, signed, and groomed. It is my position, based on my research, that the Beatles were on Tavistock's radar very early on, like many other bands, such as the Rolling Stones. I have made a case that it is highly likely Brian Epstein was a Freemason, otherwise he would not have been allowed to operate within the inner circle. We know Beatle producer George Martin, as well as EMI head Joseph Lockwood, were high-level Masons and knighted. We know that EMI was part of the British Military Industrial Complex. We know all four Beatles received MBEs in 1965. And the two surviving Beatles, Bill and Ringo, were knighted. Therefore, it is logical to deduct that all four Beatles were Freemasons. And another question I have raised has to do with Pete Best. Was Pete pushed out of the band because he was not in the Brotherhood? I believe this is very likely and the reason he was replaced with Ringo. Again, it is not possible for the Beatles to have achieved the fame and fortune they received without being in the club and controlled from the onset, because as I stated earlier, the music and entertainment industry is completely controlled. Another question that comes up often is whether Theodore Adorno of the Frankfurt School wrote the Beatles' music. Based on my research, there is no hard proof of Adorno's participation. And to complicate things, it certainly appears the Beatles did write original compositions. However, and here's the catch, writing 237 original songs, 305 with cover tunes, from 1963 through 1969 is deemed highly improbable by many professional songwriters. If we do the math, this means that John Lennon and Paul McCartney, with contributions from George Harrison, would have needed to pen, on average, 40 original songs a year. To record 40 songs a year means many more songs would be needed above the 40 per year in order to get down to those compositions deemed viable candidates for record releases. On the surface, this level of prolific songwriting does appear questionable, as well as many of the lyrics appearing beyond the life experience of 20-year-olds. Therefore, it is possible that uncredited hired guns were used to generate a backlog of songs to be considered for recording, and it is also possible that professionals were brought in to edit original songs by Lennon and McCartney to ensure proper song structure and popular appeal. For example, we know George Martin was instrumental in shaping the Beatles' sound. However, with the passing of time, more information has emerged showing his role with the Beatles to be far more involved than originally portrayed, including the writing out of guitar riffs to be played by George Harrison. Therefore, the Adorno question or an Adorno type of setup is a legitimate question since the sheer volume of songs written and recorded certainly calls into question whether the Beatles wrote all of their own material. Now let's talk about the memoirs of Billy Shears and its Masonic structure. The book's author or encoder is Thomas U. Harriet with the story being told in the first person by one William Shepard, who I refer to as Bill. Bill claims to have been playing the role of Paul McCartney since Biological Paul's death in 1966. Memoirs was originally released on September 9, 2009, and another example of specific numerology cloaked around the Beatles, in this case 999. And the updated version of Memoirs was made available for pre-order on September 9, 2018, representing another triple nine. Some Paul is Dead researchers have criticized the book by either not reading it correctly or worse, not reading it at all. Although Memoirs is classified as historical fiction, it is indeed truthful if the book is read correctly. In Memoirs, there is an abundance of masterful disclosure. Memoirs, which is written in layers, initiates its readers by degree. Layer by layer, it gradually brings people into the inner circle of what it refers to as enlightenment, 
if written, encoded, layered, and read as intended. And now let's discuss the layering and encoding within memoirs. As I just mentioned, memoirs contains three layers. Layer 1 is reading the book as we normally would from left to right. Layer 2, which is the example on this slide, is reading the bolded out text of each page. Layer 3 is the acrostical coding, or reading the text vertically, and I will show you an example of the third layer in a moment. Reading all three layers is key to digging deep and understanding the conspiracy. I highlighted the bolded out text, and here's what it says. I play the long running show. All performances require each have one role with a name in some other show. Every role has its own name. The part of Paul is the same. I go by several names. So here, Bill is telling us Paul McCartney is a role he plays, along with other characters in his repertoire. All 666 pages of memoirs are coded this way. Now let's move to the next slide and take a look at the acrostical coding. Acrostical is a series of lines or verses in which the first, last, or other particular letters when taken in order spell out a word, phrase, etc. A hidden acrostical message runs through the printed versions of the memoirs of Billy Shears. Through all of the pages, the first letter of each odd number line of each chapter or section combines to form a special hidden message that relates to the content. To the right is an example from chapter 65 of the book. In this example, the first letter of each odd numbered row has been highlighted to show the coding. Reading vertically, the first letter of each odd numbered row, the message says, The Illuminati rules the world. That and the rest of the book is true. Take the satanic connection with salt and peppers or not at all. Alistair Crowley and Kenneth Anger were miserable without love. I am William. It is as plainly shown as can be. We have different DNA, voice, and looks. It's a laugh still. Please get to know me. Now for some, this might seem very odd with talk of the Illuminati. This is the reason I presented the Pyramid of Power, Freemasonry, Tavistock, and Numerology before getting to this point in the presentation. Memoirs divulges the occult machinery behind the Beatles story. And by reading all three layers of the book, not only does the reader get a thorough understanding of the Beatle myth itself, but also an understanding of how the world is controlled by those within the Pyramid of Power, which of course includes secret societies and Tavistock. Now let's talk about the Masonic technique of masterfully speaking. For those that follow my work, you have heard me talk about how Masons masterfully speak. When a Freemason masterfully speaks, they can disclose all kinds of information if they do it masterfully. The following is an excerpt from an email I received from a high-level Mason. Quote, Initiates receive the secret Masonic traditions, along with their ritualistic enactments, signs, tokens, penalties, etc., bit by bit, grace for grace, degree by degree. If at any point they go against the pyramid, they are out. To stay in those inner circles of illumination, they can only disclose what is allowed, and only within the parameters allowed. Otherwise, they are seen as profane fools who feed pearls to swine. End of quote. For celebrities such as David Letterman or Denny Lane who joke about Paul's death and replacement, they always address the subject in a subtle, layered meaning, thus showing their place in the inner circle. They can disclose all kinds of information if they do it masterfully. John, Paul, and William, and others in that circle, such as the Rolling Stones, were skilled at concealing messages by layering meanings. Now let's discuss a recent event where Bill masterfully speaks. Masterfully speaking is very subtle, and it takes some practice to pick up on the nuances when a Mason communicates. In a recent statement to the press after receiving the Companion of Honor, Bill said, quote, I see this as a huge honor for me and my family, and I think of how proud my Liverpool mum and dad would have been to see this, end quote. Now let's analyze the statement which has two distinct components. In the first part of the statement he says, I see this as a huge honor for me and my family. Then Bill adds, and I think of how proud my Liverpool mum and dad would have been to see this. This is an example of masterfully speaking. The first part of the statement, I see this as a huge honor for me and my family, is sufficient to close the statement, since my family encompasses his parents. But by adding my Liverpool mum and dad, he is now acknowledging another set of people, biological Paul's parents, not his. This is the same method of communicating he used on a Letterman show back in 2009. 
and it is the same method Denny Lane used during an interview back in 2016 when he was asked about playing with Billy Shepard. Now let's take a moment and dissect both Bill's dialogue with David Letterman and the Denny Lane interview I just mentioned. Back in 2009, Bill was on the David Letterman show, who is also a high-level Mason, and the conversation is a textbook example of masterfully speaking. I will break the clip down to point out when the masterful speaking is taking place and decode the true meaning of what is being said. Then we will move to the Denny Lane clip and walk through that dialogue. In the, uh, toward the end of the 60s, is that when the, uh, the, the rumors about you being dead surfaced? Do you remember that? Do you remember, yeah. remember how, how that started? What, what were your feelings about that? Yeah, what happened? Yeah, my feelings. Um, yeah, no, what happened was we did a cover for a record called Abbey Road, and we... <laughs> Even the cover gets applause. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, and the idea was to walk across the crossing. And I showed up that day with sandals, flip-flops. And so, uh, it was so hot, that I kicked them off and walked across barefooted. So this started some rumor that because he was barefooted, he's dead. In this exchange, Bill tells a story about showing up to the Abbey Road photo shoot in sandals. And it was so hot that day, he took the sandals off and walked across the hot pavement barefooted. So there are two questions. Why would anyone walk across hot pavement barefooted when they have footwear to protect their feet from the heat or from possibly getting burned? This seems very odd. And why would he wear sandals to the photo shoot? The answer to both questions is quite simple. The story is not supposed to make sense. If the listener uses common sense and discernment, they would realize this story cannot be true. What Bill is communicating by telling a nonsensical story is he was supposed to be barefoot for the Abbey Road photo shoot. And the reason he wore the sandals was because he needed to easily slip in and out of his footwear because being barefoot was how the photos were to be taken. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude the death clue and the subsequent rumor was planned all along. And, and, and what do you, how do you manage uh, something like that? Because it was a, a global rumor. And, and yeah. I mean, you know, I just, I just laughed at it and knew it was just because of the fame and the craziness. It was an American DJ, so you guys are to blame. Yeah. <laughs> Not you personally, but... No, the thing is, you know, I, I just laughed it off, but it was a little bit strange, because people did start looking at me like... Yeah. Is it, is it him yeah. or a very good double? Here, Bill jokes that people looked at me very strange and asked if it was him or a very good double. By switching the wording from me to him, Bill has moved into a third-person narrative. So when he says people were looking at me, he is referring to himself as Bill. And when he says people were asking, is it him, he is referring to biological Paul. What Bill is telling us is there are two different but interwoven personalities in play, one being himself as the very good double, and the other being biological Paul. Well, that was the idea. That was the other part of it, that there was a guy who looked like you taking your place. No, oh, well... This is him. Yeah. <laughs> this exchange is very slick. Letterman says that was the idea. That was the other part of it. There was a guy that looked like you taking your place. And Bill very cleverly responds, no, well, this is him, meaning he is the replacement. Letterman's choice of wording is very interesting. What he was saying was the idea was to have someone play the part. And then Bill responds that he is that person. He is the person playing the part. He is the very good double. This is a great example of masterfully speaking between two high-level Masons. Or is it? <laughs> Here we have Bill and Letterman getting a chuckle out of the exchange as the profane masses laugh at their own ignorance. Then we have the icing on the cake when Bill puts his finger to his lips, which is the Masonic hand gesture meaning, tell no secrets. This dialogue between Bill and Letterman is masonry at its best. They are disclosing the truth for all to see and hear, but very few will understand what is being communicated to them. Now let's take a moment and analyze an interview Denny Lane did around the 2016 time period. It was a YouTube interview where the host, with more than a couple of drinks under his belt, is asking Denny Lane about what it was like to play with Billy Shepard. Let's play the clip, then analyze Denny's responses as he masterfully speaks. One final question, and this is the question I was so scared to ask you of. 
Nah. Can I ask it? Can I ask it? Go for it. Go for it. Now, then, well, okay. Uh, I'm going to go in. We, if you say cut this question, we'll cut it. Uh, this is big, what, ask, ask, it's a big setup. What, what, what was it like playing with Billy Shepard instead of uh, uh, fucking Who's, Paul McCartney? Who's Billy Shepard? I don't know. Billy Shears. The host asked Lane what it was like to play with Billy Shepard. Lane responds by asking, who is Billy Shepard? You mean Billy Shears. From memoirs, we know Shears is a play on Bill's last name of Shepard. So here, Denny is both denying and confirming Bill's surname, and only those who understand the connection to the names will understand what he is saying. Billy Shears is Billy Shepard. Ah! <laughs> Billy Shears Campbell. Thank you. That, that's all you had to say, my friend. <laughs> the interviewer incorrectly assumes Denny means Billy Shears Campbell, and then Lane chuckles with Duper's delight. With this reaction, Denny is telling us Bill's name is not Billy Shears Campbell. The one and only Billy Shear. Sir, it was an honor thank you, man. to play with you. Can I get a picture man with you? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, <laughs> can you cut that? Could have been oh, here all night otherwise. You're an amazing performer, sir. Oh, who the hell is Billy Campbell, anyway? At the very end of the interview, Lane rhetorically asks, who the hell is Billy Campbell, anyway? Correcting the interviewer's reference to the Campbell name. Now, the most important takeaway from this exchange is Denny never mentions the name Paul McCartney during the dialogue. Why did he not mention McCartney? It's because there is no biological Paul McCartney, but there is a person he refers to as Billy Shears, and that is the person he knows. Therefore, never mentioning McCartney is intentional. Now, I will run the clip again without pausing. Pay very close attention to how Denny nuances the conversation. And this is the question I was so scared to ask you of. Nah. Uh, can I ask it? Uh, can I ask it? I don't go, for it, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Well, okay. Uh, I'm going to go in. We, if you say cut this question, we'll cut it. Uh, this is a big, what, ask, ask, it's yeah. a big setup. What, what, what was it like playing with Billy Shepard instead of uh, uh, fucking Who's, Paul McCartney? Who's Billy Shepard? I don't know. Billy Shears. Ah! <laughs> Billy Shears Campbell. Thank you. That... That's all you had to say, my friend. <laughs> the one and only Billy Shear. Sir, it was an honor thank you, man. to play with you. Can I get a picture man with you? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, <laughs> can you cut that? Could have been oh, here all night otherwise. You're an amazing performer, sir. Oh, who the hell is Billy Campbell, anyway? <laughs> Let's shift gears now and discuss two scenarios involving the death of Paul McCartney. The first scenario involves Paul being murdered by the CIA or a deep state faction. This information came to me from a confidential source who claimed they were not invested in the Paul is Dead conspiracy, although they are involved in social engineering research. They told me their information was a result of a first-person encounter in the mid-1990s with people associated with the military-industrial complex. During this encounter, there was a conversation where it was revealed that there were two primary Paul replacements. One replacement was what the source referred to as the Street Paul, who was not a musician but a public figure. The other, who I believe to be Bill Shepard, was the musician Paul responsible for songwriting and performing, if this scenario is true, it may very well explain why it is difficult to reconcile the many faces of Paul McCartney. The second scenario looks at Paul's death as a result of his involvement either knowingly or unknowingly in the occult. This information was compiled from multiple sources, including my own research, and most of these sources are invested in the McCartney conspiracy. Now, I will present these two scenarios as standalone cases. However, it is highly likely the two scenarios are intertwined. Those of us who have researched the occult, the deep state, and mind control will understand these entities are all connected, and therefore overlap is not just possible, but probable. So let's move to the next slide and discuss Scenario 1. As I mentioned, the time frame of the encounter is the mid-1990s. The source attended a social event sponsored by a hedge fund. The attendees at the event included tech, research and development, and aerospace executives, along with private contractors. He suspected the hedge fund was involved in insider trading, but he did not elaborate on why he had that suspicion. 
and he also suspected they were involved in skunk works. The source claimed there was a discussion about CIA involvement in UFO and Tesla technology. And then later on, one of the attendees stated Tavistock created the Beatles and the CIA killed Paul McCartney. The source claims the person who told the story was an American with a Texas accent. If we recall, memoir states Bill was involved with the CIA via the distribution of LSD at the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967, so we have a potential link between the two sources. The person at the event claimed there were two imposters playing the role of Paul McCartney. If this is true, many questions are answered regarding the different versions of Paul we have seen over time. For example, the difference in the noses, straight versus hooked, etc. Now let's move to the next slide. The source claims he was told biological Paul was under a mind control program and a plan was in place in case Paul was not able to be controlled. And Tavistock and the CIA had two backup players in the pipeline the entire time. The two replacements consisted of musician Paul, who I believe to be Bill Shepard, whose job was to play and sing like McCartney for recording and musical performances, and Street Paul, whose real name is unknown to the source. Street Paul was to learn and master Paul's speech, facial expressions, and body movement for public, non-musical appearances. Both replacements ran in parallel. The source stated to me that Bill Shepard paged in and out of both parts throughout the years. And the disposition of Street Paul is unknown. Was he phased out or even deceased? We don't know. The story goes that biological Paul was not going along with the agenda, and the deep state staged a car accident. Agents at the scene ensured decapitation after the crash. Decapitation meant no face, no dental records, etc. And he explained both Bill and Street Paul underwent extensive surgeries, and the surgeries continued well after the car crash or the murder in 1966. So how does Scenario 1 line up with what we're told in the memoirs of Billy Shears? In memoirs, Bill states others play the role, but he has the long-term permanent contract. I would suggest that Bill's long-term contract is with regard to the musical role and not the public role. Therefore, Street Paul is one of the others mentioned in memoirs. Also in memoirs, Bill states he was selected as the replacement and met with Brian Epstein on September 12, 1966, and finalized the deal with both Epstein and Lennon four days later. The four days for inserting Bill into the equation never seemed possible to me. Now that we understand masterful speaking and disclosure, perhaps the timeline in memoirs was intentionally laid out this way to get the reader to question the chronology and conclude it was not plausible, and therefore Bill had been in the pipeline for many years. Bill admits in memoirs that the Beatles were a Tavistock project and that he worked with the CIA in the distribution of LSD at the Monterey Pop Festival. Being involved with an intelligence operation back in 1967 makes it possible that the CIA, along with Tavistock and perhaps MI6, were behind the PSYOP. Last but not least, in memoirs, Bill states the physical transformation required surgeries, fillers, and latex. It is my theory that Street Paul's transformation was way ahead of Bill's, and therefore Bill's physical transformation lagged behind that of Street Paul. This would explain the appearance of Stanchel performing in Magical Mystery Tour since he is the performer, with Street Paul being the actor playing McCartney in the movie. In other words, Stanchel's appearance in Magical Mystery Tour was foreshadowing Bill's role as musician Paul. If Street Paul's transformation was ahead of Bill's, which I believe it was, this could mean the photos we see of Paul starting in 1966, where he is depicted in the studio or in public, were actually staged photos of Street Paul posing with the band in the studio, along with being photographed in public and doing interviews. In other words, Street Paul was the public's visual bridge until Bill's transformation was established. And once Bill was ready, we started seeing both replacements showing up in photos and the media. However, and this is important, in the studio, it was Bill writing and recording the music where the rate and pace of his transformation wasn't as urgent since Street Paul had the public perception covered. We know, starting in 1966, there were no live Beatle performances to worry about. Thus, the non-musician version of Paul would fill in nicely for photo ops until Bill's surgeries caught up to the point where his appearance was convincing enough for public consumption. Once Bill's surgeries were evolved enough, we then started seeing both Pauls in pictures, and this would explain the differences in physical attributes like the nose, ears, etc. For me, 
This is not only incredibly intriguing, but starting to fill in a lot of blanks and answer a lot of questions. Now let's summarize Scenario 1 before moving on to Scenario 2. We discussed that the Beatles were a Tavistock creation, that Biological Paul was part of a mind control program, that Bio Paul's programming broke down and he was murdered by the CIA or some deep state faction, that there were two replacements in the pipeline well before 1966. Replacement number one, who I believe to be Bill Shepard, is responsible for recording and musical performances and foreshadowed his role as the performing Paul in Magical Mystery Tour by playing the character of Vivian Stanshall. Replacement number two was the public version of Paul and the actor in Magical Mystery Tour. We know the surgeries for both replacements was extensive. We can deduce that Street Paul's surgeries came first, then Shepard's. We are told Bill Shepard paged in and out of both roles once his physical appearance was convincing, and that the disposition of Street Paul is unknown. And I'll leave you with this rhetorical question. Was the dialogue between John Lennon and George Harrison regarding Beatle Bill and Beatle Ed referring to Shepard and Street Paul? I don't know, but it certainly makes me wonder. The second scenario deals with the occult and Masonic ritualistic involvement which Biological Paul either knowingly or unknowingly engaged in. In memoirs, it mentions both Paul and John were engaged in the occult, but not nearly to the degree that Bill is involved. One form of these occult forces is known as the crossroads, where one's fate can be changed. Some might call it making a deal with the devil. One can be granted fame and fortune, but there is a price. This change in your life script does not come without obligations. The mythology of the crossroads has its roots in Robert Leroy Johnson, Robert Johnson was born in 1911 and died in 1938. Notice the last two digits of those years. Robert was born in 1911, with 11 being a master number in masonry, and then the last two digits of the year he died, 38, or 3 plus 8, which equals 11. Coincidence? You can decide. Robert was also 27 when he died and one of many artists who have passed at that age, which has now become known as the 27 Club. Here are some other members of the 27 Club. I'm sure you will recognize their names. Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Brian Jones, Alan Wilson of Canned Heat, and Pete Ham of Badfinger. Now let's learn a little about Robert Johnson and his visit to the crossroads. Legend has it that while living on a Mississippi plantation, the young and impoverished Robert found his one true longing to be a master of the blues. Unfortunately, he was then a mediocre musician at best, and played his guitar and sang his songs for anyone who would listen, failing to make much of an impression or a name for himself. A shadowy figure, hearing his plight instructed him to go, guitar in hand, to the Dockery Plantation crossroads at midnight on a moonless night. Following these instructions, Johnson was met at the crossroads by the devil in the form of a large black man who tuned his guitar and played his own haunting music. When he returned the guitar to Robert, he found he had full mastery of the instrument, the devil having staked a claim to his soul in exchange for this gift, a bargain that would be collected upon at a later time. Now some listening might think this is a tall tale and nothing more than superstition. But let's now listen to a 2004 60 Minutes interview Bob Dylan did with Ed Bradley, where Bob talks about his deal with who he refers to as the chief commander. Why do you still do it? Why are you still out here? Well, it goes back to the destiny thing. I mean, I made a bargain with it, you know, a long time ago, and I'm holding up my hand. What was your bargain? To get where um, I am now. Sh should I ask who you made the bargain with? <laughs> with, 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 you know, with the chief, uh, chief commander. On this earth? <laughs> and on this earth and in, uh, and then in a world we can't see. You ever look at music that you've written and look mm -hmm. back at it and say, whoa, that mm -hmm. surprised me? I used to. Uh, I, I, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I don't know how I got to, to write those songs. What do you mean you don't know how? Well, those early songs were like almost magically written. Um, uh, darkness at the break of noon, shadows even the silver spoon, a handmade blade, a child's balloon. Eclipses both the sun and moon to understand you knew too soon there is no sense in trying. 
This Dylan classic, It's All Right, Ma, was written in 1964. Peace the hollow horn, plays wasted words, proves to warn that he not busy being born is busy dying. Well, try to sit down and write something like that. Uh, th there's a magic to that, and it's not uh, Siegfried and Roy kind of magic, you know, it's a, it's a different kind of a penetrating magic. And, uh, you know, I did it, I, I, I did it at one time. You don't think you can do it today? Mm -mm. Does that disappoint you? Well, you can't do something forever, and uh, I did it once, and I can do other things now, but I, I, I can't do that. So we just heard Dylan talk about his deal for fame and fortune. Did Paul make a deal as well? Let's explore this thought. The next three slides are highlights from correspondences with sources. John, Paul, and Bill, and others in that circle, such as the Rolling Stones, were skilled at concealing messages by layering meanings. That awareness of layered meaning is an important key for decoding their lyrics. The Paul replacement is enlightenment for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And there are two classes of people, one class who have the key of knowledge needed to understand, and the other class of people who do not possess that key. Paul is Dead demonstrates the social programmer's extraordinary power of mind control through the media. They tell the world about the switch and then tell us all to disbelieve the rumor. Some critics want to catch Bill in a lie. A better approach is to notice when he is speaking as Paul and when he is speaking as Bill. And as a side note, we can refer back to the masterful speaking segment for examples of Bill switching between himself and Paul. Now let's move to the next slide. The Beatles' rise was not organic. The media favored them, making them appear to be the idols the social engineers intended to create. They were groomed and set up for the switch. The replacement was planned well in advance. Paul would be the sacrificial virgin, which sounded glamorous to him at the start because it would make a name that would live forever. But it became more terrorizing as it grew into full expectation when things got real for him. Those who orchestrated the switch have all passed away. Full disclosure will happen after Bill passes, this slide captures a communication I had with another source who was an expert in the occult. The Beatles were watched and trained before they had full awareness of what was actually going on, but they were never in as deep as Bill. In the movie A Hard Day's Night, the And I Love Her segment shows Paul both standing in front of and standing on a black hexagon. Hex is the German word for witch or witchcraft. The video of Paul with the black hexagons indicates premeditated foreknowledge of JPM's future occult ritual sacrifice on the Coptic calendar's New Year's Day of September 11, 1966. Now let's move to the next slide, where another source sent me a link to a very interesting piece of research depicting the Ashers and a man by the name of Stephen Ward as being involved in psychological experiments. Of course, biological Paul's girlfriend was Jane Asher, and the article links Brian Epstein to Stephen Ward. Let's take a moment and listen to a quote from Mr. Ward. Quote, It would be humbug if I did not confess that I looked forward to the sex orgies. I have been to every type of that party. Those specializing in certain perversions, and those given in an elaborate setting where all the formalities were observed. Many of the people who attend are rich and famous. Many faces that are seen in public life and on television. If they're public, can only see them like this. End quote. Stephen Ward, Osteopath and Society Artist, 1963. With this quote, we can begin to understand the machinery behind the music and entertainment business, and perhaps Paul McCartney. The article goes on to say that Dr. Ward was tied to the Profumo Affair, which was a high-level British political sex scandal, and Ward had possible ties to Dr. Richard Asher, who was Jane Asher's father. The article states he allegedly supplied patients to Asher for sexual and psychological experiments and was a suspected monarch mind controller. The article also states that Brian Epstein hawked the Beatles to Dr. Ward because of Ward's high-powered and highly networked clientele, which involved organized orgies and sex trafficking. He was also a Freemason. Margaret Asher, Jane Asher's mother and music teacher, taught Beatle producer George Martin. That's an interesting tidbit of information. The article claims both Richard and Margaret Asher were psychics and telepathic and distrusted McCartney, and then asked the question, was McCartney in the hands of monarch mind controllers? If the article is accurate in its assertions of Ward being connected to both the Ashes and Brian Epstein, we could then start to see how the seedy underworld of the Beast 
can easily permeate the world of Paul McCartney and the Beatles. I will include the link to the research in the description box below. Now let's summarize what we have covered in Scenario 2. In summary, the Beatles were a Tavistock creation and project. The Beatles were a social engineering experiment. The Beatle myth was heavily immersed in the occult. The death of biological Paul was a planned ritual, and therefore the switch was always a part of that plan. It is possible Paul was in a mind control program, and full disclosure will happen after Bill passes. After hearing out the two scenarios and going back to the Venn diagram, we can now see Paul McCartney's death, whether as a result of an occult ritual or by the deep state, contains the common threads of mind control and social engineering. What emerges from the research is a very disturbing picture of what might be the real story behind the death of Paul McCartney. And now let's move to the next slide and discuss Bill's network and associations. To learn more about Bill, it's important to understand his network and associations. Having this understanding makes it easier to see he played the role of Vivian Stanshall and Phil Ackrell, and by digging into who Bill knows and interacts with, the stanshall ackrell gap begins to close. So let's take a moment and look at some of these linkages. Bill as McCartney was, of course, in The Beatles, which means he is linked to John Lennon, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, George Martin, and Brian Epstein. After the Beatles, he formed his band Wings with his old friend Denny Lane. Bill, as McCartney, was associated with Vivian Stanshall's Bonzo Dog Band as the producer of the song I'm the Urban Spaceman, and Stanshall appeared in Magical Mystery Tour, thus linking Stanshall to the Beatles. As McCartney and working with the Bonzo Dog Band, he knew Neil Innes, who was also the creative force behind the Ruddles, and Keith Moon was a very good friend of Stanshall's, and of course the Beatles knew the Who. Bill as McCartney was associated with Phil Ackrell and the Diplomats through his friendship with Denny Lane and his band Wings, as well as Bev Bevan, who played for the Diplomats and later with the Electric Light Orchestra. And we also know Jeff Lynne of ELO was in the Traveling Wilburys with George Harrison. And of course, Bill as McCartney being in Wings knows Denny Lane, who again was in the Diplomats with Phil Ackrell and Bev Bevan. Bill S. McCartney was associated with the CIA via the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967, which kicked off the Summer of Love and the LSD movement. He was signed to the EMI label, which has ties to the military-industrial complex or Deep State. He knew Jane Asher, who he socialized with before Linda, and of course he knew Brian Epstein, who may have been linked to Stephen Ward, who was suspected of being a mind control handler and involved in psychological experiments with the Ashers. This interlaced web is too involved and too deep to simply chalk up as coincidence and should motivate us to do a deeper dive into Bill and the possibility of his playing the part of both Stanshall and Ackrell. And now let me share some insights I have received from additional sources. I have had a number of correspondences with musicians in the music industry. One source, who I confirmed, collaborated with Bill during the 1980s. This person told me of a time when he entered the studio and saw Bill playing his guitar right-handed. When the source inquired about his ability to play right-handed, Bill, as Paul said, since most guitars were right-handed in the early days, I had to learn to play both ways. As a guitar player myself, I can tell you Bill's answer was weak at best, since the only effort involved in playing a right-handed guitar lefty is to reverse the string positions and then flip the guitar around. The amount of effort required to learn to play right-handed when you are a natural lefty is far more difficult than simply flipping the guitar. We never saw Jimi Hendrix, who was another notable left-handed guitarist, play right-handed because, well, there were more righty guitars than lefty ones during his day. He just restrung his Stratocaster and flipped the guitar. Therefore, Bill's response is dubious at best. The reason he was playing right-handed is simple. He is naturally right-handed. And now let's move to the next slide. A Beatle album that is overlooked yet loaded with Paul is Dead Clues is a collection of oldies, which was released December 10, 1966. At first glance, one would be hard-pressed to know it was even a Beatle album. The only reference on the front cover to the Beatles is on the drum head, where it says a collection of Beatles oldies. Note the motif of the drum, which we will see again on the cover of Sgt. Pepper. Even after realizing it is a Beatle album, few people, even Paul is Dead researchers, ever wonder or ask, who is the guy on the cover? while well, the man on the cover is Bill Shepard, dressed in his Vivian Stanshaw-like attire. The album is referred to as Oldies, when in fact it should have been called Greatest Hits. We have to ask ourselves, 
How can songs from 1963 through 1965 constitute being called oldies in 1966? This is because oldies refers to the old band. A collection of oldies symbolizes the end of the biological Paul era, or phase one of the Beatles, and is transitioning us into phase two, or the Billy Shears period. The psychedelic cover introduces the direction the Beatles will be taking going forward. And according to memoirs, the car pictured near the top of the cover represents biological Paul's car on a long and winding road. Now let's talk about Vivian Stanshall's alleged death. Stanshall's death in 1995 was not a literal death. It represents when the Stanshall character was retired by Bill due to Linda's diagnosis of cancer. We are told Stanshall died on March 5, 1995. Let's take a look at the numbers. March equals 3, the day equals 5, 3 times 5 equals 15, 1 plus 5 equals 6. 1995 equals 1 plus 9 plus 9 plus 5, which equals 24. 2 plus 4 equals 6. We are told Stanshall was 51 when he passed. 5 plus 1 equals 6. And we're back to the 6s, with Stanshall's date of death and age of death regrouping to 666. There are 66 chapters and 666 pages in memoirs. And now for some more numbers. Linda McCartney was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1995. She died at age 56. 5 plus 6 equals 11, a master number in Freemasonry. 1995 is 1 plus 9 plus 9 plus 5, which equals 24. 2 plus 4 equals 6. Then we multiply the 11 times the 6, and we have 66. And the fire symbolism can be found in many ancient cultures as a way of setting the soul free to continue its journey. For example, for those that have watched Game of Thrones, which is loaded up with esoteric references, we saw cremation as a way of having the body depart the physical world. In Hinduism, the Hindus believe the soul is indestructible, and cremation or fire cleanses the departed soul before it heads on to new experiences. By having Stanshall die in a fire, Bill is symbolically releasing his alter ego from the physical realm. And now let's get a perspective from a person who studies the human body and structure. This slide comes from a professional artist who contacted me, who has taken a very close look at Paul and Vivian Stanshall, and here are the conclusions. It is obvious Vivian is not a real person. The giveaway are the hands, shoulders, and overall body language. McCartney and Stanshall are the same person. Vivian and Shepard have the same affected comical body language, head, hand, shoulder, and hip movements, as well as the same structure and rhythm of figures seen in the stance of the legs, hips, and shoulders. By studying the hands through various photographs, the fingernails are quite recognizable. The ring finger on the left hand is very discernible too, as are the fingertips, which are flattened and have a distinctive shape. They also have the same odd hollow on the cheeks. The other major giveaway is the right eye. They have obviously constructed the eyebrow ridge to try to mimic Paul McCartney. The real McCartney looked more beat up. He was more sturdy, tough, manly in his body movements. His facial features looked stressed, including his ears and cheeks. My contact goes on to say, I am from Liverpool myself, and it may sound odd, but working-class scousers have a certain mannerism and look. Vivian did not have it at all, and was actually quite effeminate. It is also very obvious from studying photographs and film footage that there are multiple stand-in beetles. Now let's take a look at some photo comparisons of Vivian Stanshall, keeping in mind that memoir states Bill played the role of Stanshall. One mistake made by many looking into the McCartney conspiracy is overlooking the physical change in Stanshall himself. Vivian went from looking very Scottish and rugged to less Scottish and more effeminate. There are researchers who rationalize this dramatic change in appearance as being due to aging. However, this reasoning is flawed because the difference in Stanshall's appearance evolved over a short span of time, not decades. So here we see two photos of Stanshall with the Bonzo dog band. Take a close look at the call-out images to the lower right of each picture. The photo on the left is what Bill looked like before surgery. The photo on the right is Bill after surgery. If we set aside preconceived notions and maintain an objective mind, it should be obvious something very significant took place to alter Stanshall's appearance, and that something is surgery. So as we can see, in just a couple of years, Vivian Stanshall's transformation was not subtle. It was a drastic and permanent change in appearance, one that he would carry forward from this point on. On this slide, we have the revamped Stanshall in the center, 
with an image of him playing McCartney on the left from the 1967 time period. To the far right is both images overlaid, and we can see it is an exact match. Notice the flare at the nostrils, the mouth area, and the mustache. Along with the transformational progress from surgery, Bill is also donning a wig and using latex to round out the McCartney look. So between the surgery, latex, and cosmetics, the pieces are coming together. With this sequence of images, we can see how the facial features match up starting with an older version of Bill on the left and then moving across to the right to an older version of Stanshall. As the older looking Stanshall, Bill relied on the use of latex to alter the nose, cheeks, and hairline with the overall shape of the head remaining the same. This is no different than the makeup used to develop characters in movies and theater productions. Another question I get from some folks looking into the McCartney conspiracy is who is the guy with the beaked nose? Well, the guy with the beaked nose is Stanshall, who was Bill Shepard. Here I have a screen capture showing the profile of Shepard as Stanshall on a BBC program, and there's the nose. Once the surgeries were underway, there was work done on his nose to reduce the flare at the base by the nostrils, which was fairly prominent before surgery. In fact, we can see the nose was not as narrow two slides earlier when I showed the picture of Bill playing McCartney from the 1967 time period. So the mystery of who was the guy with the beak nose has been solved. It's Vivian Stanshall, who was Bill Shepard. Here's another comparison of Bill as Stanshall and as McCartney. Take a moment and notice the similarities in the facial profile by following the arrows. In fact, pause the video if you would like to take the time to study the pictures. We have the same slope to the forehead, the same curve at the top of the nose between the eyes, the same overall shape of the nose, and the same chin and jawline. Even though these pictures are 50 years apart, a discerning eye can see this is the same guy in both pictures. Here's another photo comparison of Bill. The picture on the left is obviously before surgery. Notice the overall shape of the face and eyebrows when compared to the McCartney photo. In the picture on the right, we can see the nose has been surgically altered to reduce the flare of Bill's nose by the nostrils. Over the years, the surgery and fillers are not holding up like it used to. This is due to age and the skin losing elasticity. And again, these photos are approximately 50 years apart. Now let's run some of the slides again, showing Bill's Stanshall character is also his McCartney character. Here again is the slide showing two iterations of Stanshall with the Bonzo Dog Band. Pay close attention to the dramatic change in Stanshall's facial appearance. This is the same guy. The picture on the left is Stanshall before surgery, and on the right is after surgery. Notice how his face has become softer and more feminine. Now let's focus on the post-surgery Stanshall and the McCartney character. Focus on the overall shape of the head and the mouth. In the McCartney image, Bill is wearing a wig, and latex has been utilized to mimic the McCartney look. It should also be noted that the McCartney photo may have been taken after additional nose surgery. Although, even if this is the case, we can still see the flare at the nostrils. Over time, additional surgery was performed to further reshape Bill's nose. Now let's move to the next slide. Here are the same two pictures overlaid. This is clearly the same person. Bill's McCartney character is replete with latex, makeup, and a wig. Here is a photo showing Bill before surgery, after surgery, and then in character as McCartney. The giveaway showing the first picture is the same person as the middle picture is the nose. It is the same nose with the flare at the nostrils. The face in the middle picture has been rounded out with fillers, and although the eyes have been surgically altered in the middle picture, they still show similarities to Bill's natural eye shape. Also, if you look close enough, you can see the lines in the forehead of Bill are the same in the first picture as they are in the middle picture. A mistake many make when trying to see the Stanshall McCartney connection is underestimating what can be done with plastic surgery along with latex and makeup. If you are still having trouble grasping how advanced these surgeries can be, it might be helpful to go back and take a look at the Michael Jackson slide from earlier in this presentation. Now let's move to some of Bill's family photos. Here we have the picture of Bill before the surgeries and a photo of his son James. There is certainly a family resemblance, don't you think? The shape of James's face, his complexion, and the color of his hair come from Bill. Very Scottish indeed. I also laid in a picture of Linda to show how James also has characteristics of his mother. For example, he has more of his mother's nose. On this slide, we see Bill and James along with an insert of Bill before surgery. 
Note the resemblance across all three faces. As I mentioned a few slides back, as Bill gets older, the surgeries and fillers are not holding up like they used to, and because of that, we can see the similarities to his natural appearance as well as with his son James and even his daughter Stella. Now let's look at the image on the right, which is another comparison of James to his father along with images of biological Paul. Here again, it's difficult at best to believe James is the offspring of bio Paul. He looks like Bill's kid. The differences between Bill and biological Paul become more obvious with the passing of time. In fact, I'm not even sure Bill is overly concerned with keeping up with the masquerade. For him, it's been a long run of over 50 years, and maintaining the facade has run its course. The number of clues telling us Paul was replaced is so voluminous these days that to try and capture all of them is not even possible. In fact, Bill never stopped leaving clues. He's still doing it today. But to further show Bill was Stanshall, we can take a look at the Sgt. Pepper album cover. Sgt. Pepper was loaded up with clues all the way down to the Masonic geometry of where people are standing and where they are looking with their eyes. But there is one clue in plain sight that few Paul is Dead researchers have noticed, and that is the instruments each beetle is holding in their hands. All of these are Bill's wind instruments. He is a wind instrument player by trade. We have John holding the French horn, Ringo the trumpet, George the piccolo, and Bill holding his English horn. If we go back to many of the old Stanshall videos, we see Vivian playing all of these instruments, as he does on his album Sergeant Shepard. Oops, did I say Sergeant Shepard? I meant Sergeant Pepper. And then we have the Beatles introducing us to the one and only Billy Shears, where Shears is a play on the name Shepard. Shepard, Shears, get it? And let's not forget Billy Pepper from the early 1960s with the Pepper Pots. Here is a screen capture of Stanshaw playing his English horn. This is the very same instrument Bill is holding on the cover of Sgt. Pepper. What are the odds? It's not coincidence, my friends. Now let's switch gears and discuss Bill's other character, Phil Ackrell. Admittedly, there is very limited information, especially clear photos of Phil Ackrell from his days with the Diplomats, where he played with Denny Lane and Bev Bevan from ELO fame. It appears there was a concerted effort to scrub Ackrell's pictures from the internet, along with never releasing an album the Diplomats recorded back in the early 1960s. However, in memoirs, Bill tells us he did indeed play the character of Ackrell. The first layer within memoirs is ambiguous, but the second layer of encoding reveals the truth, with Bill telling us he, meaning Phil, was a fine person, and I am them, meaning he was part of the diplomats. Bill and Denny have a long history with each other as two members of the big club, We're Not In. They started with the diplomats back in the early 1960s and then reunited when Bill formed Wings. And speaking of Wings, Bill even leaves us a Phil clue in the song Rock Show from his Venus and Mars album when he sings, What's that man holding in his hand? He looks a lot like a guy I knew way back when. It's Silly Willy with the Philly band. Could be, ooh -ee. Well, Silly Willy is Silly Billy, and the Philly band is the Phil Ackrell band, the Diplomats. Bill is Phil. And now let's take a moment to map Ackrell to Stanshaw to see that they are indeed the same person. The picture on the left is of Phil Ackrell from the very early 1960s, and the picture to the right is Stanshaw circa 1966 or so. Notice the shape of the ear, the shape of the nose with the flare at the nostrils, and the jaw and chin line. It's a very close match, if not an exact match. In 1960, Bill was 23 years old and a young man. In 1967, he was 30 years old. So we need to take into account five to seven years of his face filling out, but even with the several years in between the photos, the resemblance is very strong. Now let's move to what I believe is a great comparison mapping Ackrell to the McCartney character. This comparison is, in my opinion, a gem. Take a look at the elongated chin and jawline, then the nose and the smile. And taking into account the McCartney character has had surgery to lift the eyebrows, even the eyes look very similar. And even though these pictures are approximately 10 years apart, the resemblance, in my opinion, is uncanny. Here's another set of photos comparing the body stance of Phil Ackrell to Bill as McCartney from the Peppa era. Note the overall stance and posture. Note the left hand, the leg positioning, the jaw and chin line, and the eyebrows. Again, the similarities, even though there is a five to seven year spread between these two pictures, is very, very strong. Knowing it has been difficult for some to see Bill as Ackrell and Stanshall, I'm hoping this piece of the presentation has connected some dots showing Bill did indeed play the roles of both Vivian and Phil, and Ackrell, Stanshall, and McCartney are three different characters played by one person, Bill Shepard. 
And now let's conclude by summarizing the presentation. I don't want to refer to the summary as conclusions, since until Bill fully discloses, which in all likelihood will be after he passes, the McCartney conspiracy will continue to evolve as additional information and theories come forth by Paula's dead researchers, so I think it's best to refer to the summary as findings. In summary, the official story of the Beatles is a myth. The Beatles were not organic. The Beatles were a Tavistock creation and project. The main objective of the project was social engineering. The Beatles are a Masonic entity. All four Beatles were Freemasons. Freemasons can disclose truth by speaking masterfully. The Memoirs of Billy Shears contains masterful disclosure. The Beatles were immersed in the occult. It is possible the Beatles did not write all of their original songs. The death and replacement of Paul McCartney was planned. There were two primary replacements, musician Paul and the actor Street Paul. Musician Paul is Bill Shepard. The identity of Street Paul is unknown. Other actors playing the role of Paul paged in and out over the timeline. Bill has the long-term contract as the performing Paul. Bill is a high-ranking Mason, possibly in the illuminated degrees above the 33rd degree. Bill has been playing both musician and street Paul for a number of years. Bill played the roles of both Vivian Stanshall and Phil Ackrell. Vivian Stanshall's death was symbolic, and the real Paul McCartney died in 1966. And that wraps it up. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I would again like to thank everyone who contributed to the content via the many emails, links, videos, personal encounters, analysis, and expertise that came my way. You guys and gals are incredible. Let's continue to pursue the truth and have some fun along the way. And now stick around for some Paul is Dead video clips I think you might enjoy. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And over to George and everybody. Thank you very much. I, I don't have to say much because I'm the quiet beetle. It's, uh, it's unfortunate Paul's not here because he was the one who had the speech in his pocket. And why didn't they play uh, Octopus's Garden? We'll talk about that later. Anyway, we all know why John can't be here, and I'm sure he would be, and it's hard really to stand here supposedly representing the Beatles. Uh, it's what's left, I'm afraid. But um, we all loved him so much, and we all love Paul very much. And we all love Paul very much. George, why do you play music? Why do you still play music? Just to enjoy? Yeah. No, just, well, we got to do something, you know, with our lives. Yeah. And that's the one thing that I know what to do, you know, how to do. Hello, Neil. How are you? Hello, George. Nice well, to see you. Very nice. Hello, Hello vegetarian, Mother Jacket. <laughs> Hello, George. Yeah? Yes. Oh, is that a film? Yeah, I've got you. Oh, you look very bright. This is the one I can see. Go and turn it off. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I don't want to turn it off. Yeah. I've seen that sharpie. I've seen yeah, the handle. Hold it. Who is this? That's John. John. Oh, is it? John Lennon of the Beatles. Oh, that's what's the name? Ah, that's... Who is this? So we from? don't know who that is. Oh. Some other lady. God, they were horrible. Lady of the night. Horrible girls, weren't they? No, George. It's a very fine leg. It's a nice bit of stocking top. Mm. Just because you've graduated in the world. <laughs> They're fine ladies. It's kind of like when I met Paul McCartney. Um, I, I'd never even been on Saturday Night Live. He was hanging out at Lorne Michaels' house. And, you know, I had the presence of mind at that moment not to go, you know, who, who wrote A Hard Day's Night? You know, so I said, uh, I, I talked about his album, 1980, and the song Tug of War. And I said, you know that lyric in the chorus, some, one day we'll stand up on top of the mountain with our flag unfurled, but it won't be soon enough. And he just lit up. He 
He just lit up. Oh, that was a song, you know, I was a picture of a big flag, you know, up on the top of a mountain, you know. And then, and, and then that was it. That was it. We were fast friends after that. So I think with Billy, um, people like it. If you take one of his obscure songs or obscure album and be very specific about a lyric that he wrote, people love that. You know, it'd be the same thing with uh, Slayton. If you brought up some obscure bit from 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, you like that, huh? That was good. It's all right. Yeah. All right. All right. What's it like to be Bobby all day long? Well, mostly he's just quiet in a room. He has to, has to rest those pipes and hey. <laughs> Thank you.